Hello everybody and greetings from the Delta College Planetarium. My name is Brian and I'm here to bring you the next episode in our continuing series about the constellations. This episode is going to be a little different. Instead of focusing on one constellation in the sky, we're going to take a look at three closely related, small and dim constellations. The goal is to sort of clean up the rest of our summer constellations. We return to the Summer Triangle, which is high overhead after sunset during the high summer. We've already looked at Lyra, Cygnus, and Aquila, the three constellations that anchor the Summer Triangle. We're going to turn our attention to some of the faint stars on the left-hand side of the triangle, along the leg between Altair and Deneb. The first one we'll look for is the distinctive but dim constellation Sagitta. If you watched our episode about Sagittarius, then you know that Sagittarius means archer, so Sagitta means arrow. Even though Sagitta is quite dim, that arrow shape is easy to spot, with the head of the arrow to the left and the fletching to the right. Along the shaft of the arrow is another Messier deep sky object, this one Messier 71. A telescope will show M71 to be a cluster of stars. For hundreds of years, it was thought that M71 was an open cluster, a star cluster lacking the dense character of a globular cluster. But astronomers have been able to determine that M71 is actually a globular cluster, just a young one. M71 appears to only be about 9 to 10 billion years old, as opposed to about 12 billion years found for other globular clusters. This may account for M71's irregularities in structure and composition. Sagitta's direction of flight appears to point towards a diamond shape of stars, with a short tail coming off one of the corners. This is Delphinus, the dolphin. Though relatively dim, its compact and distinctive shape make Delphinus relatively easy to recognize. A telescope will reveal that the head of the dolphin, a star called Gamma Delphini, is actually a binary star. Magnifying the star about 125 times will separate it into its two components. The primary star generally appears yellow to the eye, but the secondary has been reported as appearing as anything from light yellow to green to light blue. So if you have a telescope, be sure to check out this binary star and see what colors it appears like to you. The final constellation we'll look at is the dimmest of the three, and mostly is included for completeness. Between Sagitta below and Cygnus above sits the constellation Vulpecula, the little fox. The brightest star in Vulpecula is magnitude 4.4, so the entire constellation is hard to see with any light pollution, but there is a very famous deep sky object located within Vulpecula's borders. Moving from the tip of Sagitta up towards Vulpecula and Cygnus, a telescope, or even binoculars under very dark skies, will show the presence of a fuzzy object. Under greater magnification, this object will show its distinct two-lobed structure. This is M27, the Dumbbell Nebula. M27 is a planetary nebula, the final stage of a sun-like star. The star has thrown off its outer layers, and because we're looking more or less at the equator of the system, we can see the bi-directional nature of the ejection. Larger telescopes will reveal more of the structure within the lobes, like the knots and filaments of stellar material making up the nebula. M27 is one of the brightest planetary nebulae seen from Earth, it's a great object to find in telescopes for starting amateur astronomers. So if it's clear where you are tonight, go out and take a look for these three constellations, Sagitta, Delphinus, and Vulpecula. Okay, you probably aren't going to see Vulpecula, but if you have a telescope, definitely take it out and look for that planetary nebula M27, the Dumbbell Nebula, found in Vulpecula. That's it for today. Next time we'll take a look at another constellation. This is Brian from the Delta College Planetarium wishing you clear skies.